Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. It's always the privilege that I have to introduce to you men and women who've made the journey following Jesus Christ home to his church, the Catholic Church. Pray for us whenever we have this program because I believe that when we are defending and following Christ, we're often under spiritual battle because the enemy doesn't want us to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. On my program tonight is a guest, first of all, that you've seen a couple times, not only on my program, but a couple others, uh, Paul Thigpen. But I've decided to invite his better half with us tonight. His wife, Lisa, is joining us, and we're going to talk about their own journey together as a couple into the Catholic Church. But also, they are authors of a, a, a book on establishing traditions, Catholic traditions for the family. And being on the eve of the Jubilee, it was a good opportunity to have them talk about establishing family traditions as we look to the future. And Paul is an editor of many books on the Jubilee, so he'll also have some information to help us prepare for the Jubilee. You're an important part of this program, as always, so why don't you call your questions to us at 1-800-221-9460, or you can send us an email at journeyhome at ewtn.com. Welcome to both of you, Lisa Thank you, and Paul. Marcus. Thank you, Mark. It's good to have you back. It's I've great to be back. had you a bunch of times Absolutely. back here. And it seemed like a great opportunity to have you both here. Sometimes I've received letters that said, we've heard enough of the husbands. Let's hear the <laughs> wives' side of the story. And actually, your story was printed in uh, the book Journey's Home that we published on the Coming Home Network. And it was called, um, I forget, it was about waiting two years or... Love compelled me. Love compelled me to wait because you had been called in your heart deeply to come home to the Catholic Church, but uh, Lisa wasn't ready, and so there was that issue of timing, God's calling, and we're going to talk about that. But also because of your uh, calling that God has given you to help us understand the importance of traditions. All right, I, as converts, when you come, maybe without traditions. Which ones do you accept? Which ones are the best for us to follow? So we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, as we begin, though, well, let's begin, first of all, Lisa, with giving the audience a little bit of a background, your spiritual background, so they know where you've come from in your journey. Okay, well, I was raised in the Methodist Church, and the Methodist Church I, our family belonged to was a very liturgical church, um, pretty, pretty close to Anglican for our Methodist Church. And uh, I think that that was the Lord's way of preparing me for my future in the Catholic Church. I, things liturgical were familiar to me mm -hmm. from my upbringing in the Methodist Church. And Paul was raised in the Presbyterian Church, but we met and married in, the, in a char non-denominational charismatic church. When you married or were dating, did you know that he was aiming towards the ministry at the time? No, not really. <laughs> he, had, he had his college degree in religious studies but wasn't sure what he was going to do with it and um, I guess that was pretty far from our minds at the at the time anyway. Mm -hmm. At least you snuck it up on her. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you go back to those uh, Protestant days in your life, your Methodist tradition, your Presbyterian traditions, I mentioned you use the word tradition because with our theme being family traditions, talk a little bit about how you understood traditions as a Methodist or a Presbyterian? Well, I, my own background, folks often quoted passages from the Bible about the traditions of man, and they talked about empty traditions and empty ritual, that kind of thing. And uh, I saw that that could, could be a possibility, but I saw that in my own church there are plenty of traditions and, and empty rituals as well. Um, but, I, you know, I, when I looked at the word tradition, and to study that it simply meant that which is passed on or handed on, passed over. And so I, I thought, well, that's really a neutral term in itself. You can pass on good things and you can pass on bad things. So there are good traditions and there are bad. Uh, what are some good traditions? Hmm. And uh, you mentioned me earlier that you actually, in fact, uh, published a book. That's right. We, that were, uh, we were especially concerned with family traditions. We had, on our own, begun to put together some family customs that we found were strengthening our family life. and uh, But we were having a hard time finding spiritual traditions for the home. 
there seemed to be, at least in the context we were in, there didn't seem to be much that people did, maybe an occasional thing at Christmas or something, Easter. And so we finally decided, we, why don't we do some research and put together a book so other people can find something that we've had such a hard time finding. And that was when you were still a Presbyterian or Methodist. You were Methodist by the time? Well, or? At that time, right. I think we were, uh, we were walking ecumenical movements, okay. actually. <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> okay, were charismatic by then. I think. All right. Yeah. All right. But then at some point, I forget exactly when in the journey, uh, Paul is drawn to the Catholic Church. Well, what was it that got you started in your journey to the Catholic Church? Church history is what took me the furthest. I was going through a, a master's and a Ph.D. in historical theology, and those, those things were pushing me to the Church Fathers to read, St. Okay. Augustine. So as Newman others. says, to become deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. That yeah, was starting what to happen to with you. That's right. Now, were you married at the time, I presume? Yes. We were. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Paul was always a closet Catholic, though. <laughs> <laughs> he confessed that to me years later. Is yeah. that right? He was always a closet Catholic, yes. <laughs> well, I've, always, I've been attracted by the Eucharist, by liturgy, although uh, we were wild Pentecostals, you know, very exuberant <laughs> kind of worship with tambourines and dance and that kind of thing. It's far away from traditional liturgy, as you can imagine, and yet there was something inside of me calling. Hmm even without having a background. You say he was a bit of a closet Catholic. Yes. It was surprised you though. I mean, it wasn't what you knew of him early on in your dating or? I, no, not early on because we were, you know, when we were dating and before we married, we were in an independent charismatic church and I had no idea until years later that he really was a closet Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew he always had a love for things liturgical. Mm -hmm. um, as I did myself, I w we were both drawn to those kind of, to liturgical things. Yeah. It's interesting that it's another topic, but those who are of the independent, non-denominational, charismatic, don't think of their worship as liturgical, but in many ways it is very liturgical, isn't it? There are things that they do all the time and regularly. There are traditions. <clears throat> and in fact, there's been a large movement within the charismatic movement That's right. back toward liturgical forms of worship. I wrote an article for a, a, a major Pentecostal magazine about that, and as soon as the article came out, the church that I featured began getting calls from all over the country and saying, we've been hearing the same thing from God. We, we're longing for liturgy. What do we do? And that, that group, though they didn't become Catholic, they're what you might say high Anglican. Yeah. Now in their last I heard were the fastest growing denomination in the country. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he is, besides being closet Catholic, he's actually seriously being drawn to the church, even to the point of probably announcing to you at some point he's ready to become Catholic. Yes. How were you, in your own journey at this time, responding to his leadings of faith? Well, we had always been united in our faith. We had always gone to the same church, and the notion that he wanted to become Catholic was mm -hmm. mind-boggling to me. I, I'm a person who likes certainty. I like things the same way all the time, and to me, the thought of joining the Catholic Church was like the thought of moving to another country and learning a new, whole new language and a whole new way of life. And I didn't want to do that. It was just foreign to me and I didn't want to do that. And I really resisted him for basically two years after he decided that he needed to do this. I basically resisted him because I was afraid of what I didn't know. Growing up, I had friends that were Catholic. Um, the town I grew up in had a large Catholic population. We had neighbors that were Catholic, but I didn't really know anything about the Catholic yeah. faith. I knew these people were Catholic, but I didn't know uh, anything about their faith. It was scary to me. Yeah. Especially when threatening as it is when your husband's considering that. What, would he share things that he was learning? Uh, was it appealing to you or repulsive to you as he shared? He shared things that he was learning, but I, to be honest, I had a closed mind. Uh -huh. I didn't want to make another change. We had made several changes in our marriage. Um, you know, like I said, I, I was raised Methodist. We had been in an independent charismatic church when we got married. We left that. We joined the Methodist church together. We left that. We joined in another independent charismatic church. We left that. We joined the Assemblies of God. <laughs> we had literally, like Paul said, been in all kinds of... Searching. Yeah. Yes. All the, all the while searching for truth, though. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that that's what... We were always unsettled because we couldn't really find the truth. And um, I didn't want to make another change. Mm -hmm. Now, I he really came didn't. in without you. Is that right? 
He came into the Catholic Church? Yeah, we, we okay, that's right, together. that's right. We, we did come in together, but I came in really just as an act of obedience, okay. um, just because I, to not, not to Paul, but to God. I felt like <clears throat> I had to. I didn't want our families going to two different churches mm. at different times on Sunday mornings, and who would take the kids with them. You know, I didn't want our, our family to be divided in the very thing that was the heart of our family life, and that was our faith. I wanted us to be together, and so I came into the Catholic Church with Paul, and our children came in also, but I didn't come in with my heart okay. it was more at that a, time. an accommodation at first. It was an accommodation at first. Well, I, what happened? Did, did, did that your faith didn't grow? Uh, how, did your heart ever open to the Catholic Church? I presume oh, yes, it did, of course. It did, Let's talk about it. Well, to be honest, I, I resisted for a while, and then the um, first... Lenten season of our time in the Catholic Church, a instead of giving up something for Lent, I decided to take on the reading of some of the lives of the saints because I realized I wasn't giving the Catholic Church a fair shake. I, I didn't know enough about it to, and I thought that one of the best ways for me to get to know my faith was to read the lives of the saints. And so Paul would check books out of the um, college library for me, and I would read these saints and I began to fall in love <laughs> and I just felt I could identify with a lot of the saints especially Saint Rita who had been a wife and a mother um, Saint Teresa of Avila I, I could identify with some of these saints that I was reading about and through their lives the Lord began to really open my heart and I began to have a deep appreciation of what I had come into uh, did you yourself have to deal with the doctrinal issues, uh, I'm sure uh, Paul in his own readings, I know we've talked of dealing with all the big differences. How about yourself? Did you work through those? Or? The main, my main problem was that when we first came into the church, I told Paul, I'll come into the Catholic Church with you, but I will never pray to the saints, and I'll never have statues in my home, and I'll never <laughs> pray to Mary. And guess what, we have statues all over the house and we pray the rosary and, and I ask for the saints intercession all the time. Um, well, let's talk about that, that because that there may be someone the out there saying, oh, she just folded. She folded under the pressure. I, I well, didn't fold. Well, but, I, know, I came but to an, an understanding. Okay, all right. Maybe something to talk about, like maybe, you know, maybe to have you talk about the, uh, what is there about the statues that changed in your understanding of their, in your faith for you? Well, I thought the, statues were kind of hokey you know before and and <laughs> some of them that I had seen anyway were not very well done and um, I like fine art you yeah. know and, and some of them weren't very well done and I just thought that it was kind of tacky and have statues sitting you're around. Because from a, and, a Protestant view of art it, 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 it's a different understanding of art. It is. It's, it's, but now I come to look at them as a reminder of yeah. who they represent you know what and especially now that I've read so many of the lives of the saints. Um, I, I understand who they are, what those statues represent, and they are a reminder of me, for me, to keep on, keep on learning, keep on growing. If we're inspired by uh, Thomas More's courage and uh, conviction to stand by conscience, a picture of him on our desk will constantly remind us of that call. Our living mind. room walls are covered with pictures of our loved ones. That's right. You know, we have ancestors and brothers and sisters, and so why not a picture of <laughs> Mary, our blessed mother as well? It's, uh, it's a very human thing. And even folks who reject the notion of statues or religious pictures will have images of the people they love around them. May even give them a kiss sometimes, you know, that kind of thing. What we would call veneration. They show honor to the image not because they value the image, but because they value the one that the image represents. Mm -hmm. In the work that you help me with from time to time in, in, in the Coming Home Network, as we have Protestant clergy, their families, and, and laymen examining the Catholic Church, I would estimate that 80% of the time, those that come, come at different stages than their spouse. It's very common. <coughs> Reflecting on your own journey, what were the reasons that caused you to go at different paces? What, what are the general reasons that lead to different paces? Start. I, uh, I, I had the privilege 
of spending most of my time reading historical theology for two or three years in my graduate programs. That's a, that's a luxury that most folks don't have. Mm. And it was like a crash course in Catholic faith. I was reading the Fathers, I was reading St. Thomas Aquinas, reading so many other folks. And day by day, I was spending my time reading this. Well, what's my wife do? Lisa is taking care of the kids, homeschooling her kids, taking care of the home, all those things. She doesn't have the same luxury that I do. And so it's as if I, I got a crash course and she didn't have that. So that's one reason why we ended up in, in different places. I think, too, our, our temperaments are rather different. I tend to go for the abstract, and she's more concrete. Uh, she's she likes more practical. adventure, I don't. <laughs> this, this was an adventure. <laughs> yeah. And she's much more practical. You know, so <clears throat> she would, I would say, you know, read this, look at what St. Augustine said, and she would say, but, but we went to that Catholic parish, and you know, people were doing crazy things, and to, to her on a practical level, it was just all yeah. oh, alien. Right. What about in the struggle that we have with our family and friends? Are those the same issues that, that you encountered and makes it so hard for us to tell them about what we're going through and being drawn to? It is. I mean, how, you want to start talking about praying to Mary, you have to back up a mile <laughs> and start talking about the communion of saints and yeah. what the word prayer means and, and yeah. so many things. And, uh, and you don't always have the luxury of that much time with your your extended family or friends to, to go through all that, and they may not want to may, may not want to take the time. And there's no easy answer to how do I reach out to family and friends who have, don't have the information or mm -hmm. don't take the time to examine, are content to sit with their presumptions about the church and never take the time to examine. That's part of the problem that in some of the couples that we've dealt with, where one is on fire, and then the other one doesn't want to make an effort. Uh, and the, the teachings of the spiritual fathers say that if you're not growing in your faith, you're going another <laughs> direction. We're called to examine our faith one way or the other. And in your own journey, you, uh, as becoming Catholic, you saw the need for a book on building Catholic family traditions. Talk about how that got started. You had printed a book earlier. Mm -hmm. Why do one now that you've come to the Catholic Church? Well, we came into the Catholic Church, and we learned the theology. We had a very brief six-week RCIA program. I won't go into that. But the, uh, we, we realized all of a sudden that we didn't know what it meant to be a Catholic family. I mean, we knew it to be a Christian family, but specifically Catholic. What do Catholic families do when the doors are closed in their home? And uh, we'd heard of the rosary, but no one had ever talked to us about it. We didn't know how to pray it. We even, I think I'd even heard of family altars. And, you know, religious art in the home, uh, certain table graces, but we didn't know any of that. And we had to start finding other Christian families and say, tell us, what, what is a Catholic table grace? Uh, tell us, how do you pray the rosary as a family? What does it mean? Um, tell us, what do you do at Christmas or at Easter that's specifically Catholic? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, no one had, I mean, I'm not blaming people for not telling us, but we had to search so hard and grab people wondering. to find out that we finally said, we need to do a book on this. Was <laughs> it hard to find? <clears throat> Well, we, by the time, we, a few months after we came into the church, we moved to uh, Augusta, Georgia, and there was a wonderful parish, Most Holy Trinity, and there was a wonderful Catholic families there who reached out to us mm -hmm. and took us into our home and began to, just by example, to show us all kinds of things. But we thought, what about other folks in our situation? You know, even cradle Catholics, who uh, maybe they, they were raised in families that didn't practice too many spiritual traditions at home. Uh, wouldn't it be nice for them to have a, a book to at least point them, point them out some possibilities? It, it's preserving not just the traditions in that sense, but the fact that many of those who grew up practicing traditions are elderly now, mm -hmm. and that we're losing that great knowledge right. of those traditions. They're That's a wonderful so. resource, and we felt like we just had to tap mm -hmm. into that right away. And mm -hmm. so we asked some elderly Catholics, you know, what, are, what did you do as a child? Yeah. What, you know, how did you raise your family? And, they were a wonderful resource. Talk about some of the traditions that are specifically Catholic that you found uh, particularly exciting to learn about or to, to practice in your family. Well, the family rosary, of course. Huh. I mean, that, that goes without saying. Uh, for us, did the, you learn how to say it when you have a four-year-old going around spinning? <laughs> <and nothing? laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, they were quite young, and that was a good experience. Our four-year-old just wore around his neck, <laughs> glow-in-the-dark rosary around his neck. <laughs> The notion of a, of a family altar, 
that you, it's, it's a very sacramental idea, you know, the, that is, comes naturally to Catholics, but to a lot of Protestants not. The idea that within your home, you would set aside one place as sacred in a, in a particular way, that a place that visually and in every other way you can points toward eternal things, especially to, to the Lord and to his saints. Maybe a table, maybe a shelf, but it would have some religious images, maybe flowers, candles, might even burn a, a votive candle. I mean, the whole notion of a votive candle, we hear that word, Kmart sells votive candles, but what does that mean? Most people don't know the word votive means prayer, having to do with prayer. It's a prayer candle. Just the notion that you can pray a prayer, light a candle, and leave it lit as a very concrete way of reminding yourself and the Lord and everyone else that your prayer is going up to heaven the same way the smoke is in the flame. I mean, that's a very small thing, but that's a, it's a very beautiful thing. So that was a beautiful one for me to learn about the, the notion of a family altar, a place where you, you set it aside. And, and when you go there, it's very clear from the images and the other things you have there that this is, uh, this is a sacred place, a place for prayer, a place to point you toward heaven. Uh, I think in your book you talked about, as a core understanding of the importance of these traditions, is the, uh, the sig significant place that physicality, mm -hmm. physicalness, plays in Catholic theology. Talk about that a little bit, if you would. Because, again, well, our Protestant background didn't, sure. didn't have sure. very much room for that. The, <clears throat> the reality of the heart of Catholic faith, all Christian faith, is the incarnation, that God, who is beyond and above energy and matter in his created world, actually chose to come into his created world, take on the nature of human beings, join it to his own nature forever, and by doing that, elevate it into something it could have never been before, yeah. to become the great channel of grace yeah. for all the world. And that principle gets repeated then in Christian faith. The, the saints become... Uh, not capital S sacrament, but in a little way, like sacramentals, the, the grace of God comes to us through them. The grace of God comes to us through the seven sacraments, most especially the Eucharist, which is, and when I, <clears throat> but when I say that the, the faith is sacramental, I'm saying that God has chosen to take what is physical and make it a vessel of what's spiritual, of, of the natural and make it a vehicle of the supernatural, of the ordinary and make it the carrier of the extraordinary. And, that's the, the, and that all of life is like that if we allow him to do that. The sacraments, bread and wine, oil, water, and baptism, those kinds of things, they, it's not magic, as we you know, tend to think in Protestant circles, but that God, by his power and his love, chooses to unite his grace to these things and make them vehicles of the grace for us. And so in addition to the sacraments, we have sacramentals, we have the crucifix, we have holy water, we have blessings, the sign of the cross, incense, uh, palm branches, ashes at Ash Wednesday, all those things, because they're joined to the prayer of the church. It's not quite the same as a sacrament, but a sacramental. They carry this power. And so Catholic faith is very visual, very concrete. You light the votive candle. doesn't mean that there's some magic in the candle, but it means that if that candle's been blessed, the prayers of the church are united to that thing. And there's a grace in it for you and for those around the Catholic Church appeals to all of our senses. There's, there are smells with the incense. There's beautiful stained glass windows that we see. And then, you know, it, it just appeals to every one of yeah, our the senses, bells. the bells that we hear. Um, and and some, so many of the traditions appeal to all the senses yeah. as well. Um, you light the Advent candles at, during the Advent season. You smell the greenery that you've made the wreath out of you see the light, you smell the light, you know. Um, so many of the traditions appeal to all of the senses, and that's really good for children especially. They, they learn better w when more of their senses are involved, and we found the church just rich in so many of these traditions that it could appeal to all the senses. Especially if you, if you see that the end goal of our walk with God is a changed heart and the avenues to the heart are through our senses. And if you eliminate the physicality, what you see, touch, and hear, and you limit only to what we think, mm -hmm. you know, that's a limited way to the heart. And it's a denial of the resurrection, ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. It is, because we are both body and spirit. Yeah. And God's going to redeem it all. He's going to resurrect it all. He's going to restore it all. Yeah. And to try to see ourselves as disembodied minds, <laughs> yeah. and that the gospel only goes this far. It doesn't work. It's, not, it's just not true. 
Um, were there any of the traditions coming from your Protestant background that were a bit, a bit rough to handle <laughs> on the journey, or when you're writing about it, you're learning about it? <laughs> yes, shall I? Is it? Well, we. Uh, I'll be nice here. It's, he it's, it's just, no, it's just uh, it, it really struck us as odd when we we were trying to sell our home and move a few months after we came oh. into church, and one of our Catholic friends said, "You've got to get a statue of Saint Joseph." I said, well, what do I do with that? Well, you take it and you bury it in the yard, upside down, <laughs> facing east or something. I don't, I don't know. know. <laughs> it was, you know, and I, I said, you know, it was in, in that strange situation where it sounds odd to me, but I'm learning a whole lot of things that would have seemed odd, you know, a few months ago. <laughs> Maybe we should try it. So uh, that, that one was a little hard for us, but we did. We, we went out, we got a statue of St. Joseph, and we said, okay, this is not magic, and we're not going to bury him upside down. And I don't like the idea of putting his face right in the dirt. I'm going to put him in a little plastic bag. <laughs> and dig a hole, and we're going to pray. St. Joseph, we need your intercession. You're a patron of fathers and husbands and homes, families. Yeah. We need to sell our homes. Which is, that's the important part of it. Exactly. Life. That was the, the part. Prayer. It was not magic, but in doing that, it was an act of faith to say, this home, St. Joseph, we ask your prayer for yeah. and for our situation. And we sold the home. But it was not unusual. But it's funny thing, that really I know a number of converts that didn't want to tell anybody <laughs> they did it. But I've just told worked. the world. It, yeah. <laughs> but it worked. It's always funny. It worked. St. Joseph, thank you for your prayer, your intercession. That's the key. Again, it gets back to the understanding of communion of saints and their yes. intercession for us. Uh, well, it's not magic. I mean, it, that's the it, thing. I, you know, we are accused, and this is it's all the way back to the Reformation, the, the accusation that Catholics are, <clears throat> are trying to perform some kind of magic. No, magic is what you do with crystals when you think the crystals have power in themselves. This is sacramentals only have some kind of grace attached to them because of God's activity mm -hmm. and then our responding faith. A um, couple minutes before the break. Uh, we're on the threshold of the Jubilee. What a great time to re-examine the traditions of our lives. Mm. Any thoughts on where to begin? How to start establishing some of these traditions you mentioned in your book? Well, the American bishops have urged us uh, that, that we should be living Jubilee and there are nine different ways that they instructed us to do that, and one of them was to be the domestic church. Yeah. And by that, they mean to strengthen family life in Catholic faith. So I think this is an excellent time. In fact, for us, it's, it's been a common thing to, uh, at the end of a year, to kind of take a survey of where we are with traditions or with customs, to ask ourselves what kinds of customs we might want to establish or which ones have become anemic and need to be revitalized. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a perfect time to start with that, start taking a survey of where we are and our families and what kind of customs we need. And where we need to be in the future mm -hmm. uh, yeah. to meet the goals that we have for our family. And that takes knowing your family. You bring your family involved in the discussion, oh, right? Sure. Oh, absolutely. In that sense. Uh, and ask an honest question. You know, we've, we've done this for years. Does it mean anything to you? Sometimes you find out it means something very different to your kids mm -hmm. from what it means to you. And if you dare suggest we give it up, they just protest loudly, and you never even knew that they cared that much. <laughs> but that's a good thing. You begin to find out what the, what the traditions mean to your family. I'm also reminded of that verse in Romans 12 that says to be not conformed to the world, mm. but transform. And so that it helps us examine our traditions to see what have we just picked up because the culture says we've got to do mm -hmm. it. And what do we want to do for our family? Especially as we looked into the new year. What, are some, what a great way to start a new millennium by establishing some good traditions for mm -hmm. our families. Mm -hmm. Please stay with us. We'll be right back for your questions for the Thig Pens about the journey home. Welcome back. Our guests for this evening are Paul and Lisa Thigpen. They've talked about their journey on the faith uh, into the Catholic Church at different stages, the Lord drawing you at different paces, which puts tension on the marriage and tension on uh, your, your faith as a family. As you said, you're very committed to the same church together. You also talked about establishing Catholic traditions, so you might have some questions. You'd like to call in about that. And we're on the threshold of the Jubilee, and Paul has written a number of books, edited a number of books about the Jubilee, preparing for the Jubilee, right, and 
so everyone out there should be quite prepared with those. How many, <laughs> four books on the Jubilee? I think it's been four now. Yeah. That's right. Mostly on John Paul's That's right. teachings That's right. about the Jubilee. So we're looking forward to your, quest your questions for tonight. Let's start with the first email. This comes from John in Altoona, Pennsylvania. Hello, Marcus, Paul, and Lisa. A lot of people on Journey Home have been previously Methodists. Have you ever gone back to your old church or faith and worked with other couples to come over to the Catholic Church? Can you share with us your previous minister's opinion and reaction to your move to our Catholic faith? Thanks for sharing us your experience. Have you ever gone back, uh, looked at it from, from a different eyes now, and then what about the, the reaction of those when you told them you were leaving? At the time we joined the Catholic Church, we had not, we didn't have a pastor, we had we were just kind of unchurched for a while. I guess we were trying to figure out what we were going to do with ourselves, and we were not really attending regularly, so that wasn't something we really had to deal with, was telling a pastor. I was on the edge of founding my own church. I mean, it had gotten to that point where I thought, I want to be Catholic, I believe all these things are right. She, she just can't seem to do that. Maybe I should back up. Maybe God's telling me I should start a church that looks a lot like a Catholic church but would be more acceptable. <laughs> we went through so many things. But by that time, we had withdrawn. We had lots of ca uh, Christian friends, and we're in fellowship. We were meeting our, you know, just in our home for a while. It yeah. was uh, So we, we didn't have an immediate impact. There were people, though, in church, churches we had belonged to before uh, for whom the impact was rather sharp, I think. You know, I think to lifelong Catholics, the idea of starting your own church sounds <laughs> a bit arrogant, uh, you know, yes. uh, absurd almost. But, but actually, outside the Catholic Church, that's not an uh, absurd or far out idea at all. Is oh, it happens all the time. I mean, time. you get unhappy with where you are, you just go start your own church. You don't even need a seminary degree or anything. Yeah. Uh, we had friends urging us to do that. It, was, it seemed like maybe a solution, but it became very clear before long that that was, for me anyway, was just going to be a substitute, not a very good one. Yeah. It was going to be prolonging the agony, really, for Paul yeah, yeah. to have done that. Let's take our first caller. It's Linda from Kentucky. Hello, Linda. What's your question for us tonight? Hi there. Um, my husband, Todd, and I were both brought into the church in Easter of 1999. Uh -huh. and uh, one Welcome home. Thank you. <laughs> um, we feel very much at home. Um, one passage from uh, Scripture particularly uh, worries us a little bit. It's, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have life in you. And the lack of Eucharist and other sacraments uh, have made us concerned about our Protestant friends and family. And the question is, did you feel called to uh, share your faith with your Protestant friends and family and as an act of spiritual mercy? And if so, how have you handled it? Thank you, Linda. That verse she mentioned is one of those many verses that we didn't see in our Bible before. <laughs> uh, didn't deal with it very well. But as she said, it speaks pretty strongly about the reality of the sacraments. How, do we, how should we view those outside the church that don't have those sacraments? And how should we talk to them about them? Well, I think we have to view them that we Vatican II, the fathers of Vatican II view them, that they are Christian brothers and sisters and uh, that they are connected in some way to him and, and even through the church to him. But that there's a fullness that's lacking. Uh, just, the very, just the very fact that we didn't have the Eucharist before that I didn't understand, wasn't in touch with the communion of saints, makes it a very real thing to me that f to talk about the fullness of Catholic faith is not just an abstract, but a very real practical thing. I, I, didn't, I didn't know that I had Mary as my mother before. I didn't have access to the Eucharist before. So, or confession. Or confession. Oh, so many things. You, you know, so many things. Confess our sins. Yeah. So it's, it's a lack of fullness. And, but even, you know, beyond that, I mean, I... I uh, a and not A cannot both be true, and there are some Protestant teachings that we've mm -hmm. come to believe and to know really are not true. So it's not just a lacking of fullness, but in some cases, very, very serious error. Mm -hmm. To answer the question, that makes it very difficult. Yeah. We've uh, there are some folks that we've had long conversations with, others we've had short conversations with. I've had students that I've had conversations with because they want to know why I would go from the Assemblies of God or another church to the Catholic Church. Family members, uh, we love them. They've, they've been really good toward us. Um, I, th I know they've been puzzled at times, and we've, we've had conversations. And it's helped, and some, some of our family members, extended family members, have, have married in the Catholic uh, faith, and so 
they're getting it from other folks, not just us, that they are, the Catholics are, are not strange, <laughs> <laughs> foreign people. For the most part, That's we've it. just let them ask questions. We mm -hmm. haven't tried mm -hmm. to go out and say, did you know this and did you know that? And mm -hmm. we've mostly let them ask questions and let that be our guide in um, talking to them about the sacraments and what they're missing. From your experience, would you say that indifferentism is also a major barrier to fans, family and friends seriously considering the Catholic Church? Sure. The notion that it, it really doesn't matter, <laughs> that it really doesn't matter where you are. Um, as long as you just have Jesus, uh, I mean, that would almost be what would, would make going out and forming your own church plausible, exactly. because if it does, if the church itself is a man-made tradition, right? Uh, look, that look at it from that standpoint, then, hey, you just go form your own. So we have to almost begin by this, why church is essential, established by mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, with the sacraments and traditions. It's so different for every family. Yeah, I, I know of families where the, the folks became Catholic and then went right away and began working on family members and the whole family became Catholic or something. And, uh, but I know others too where there's just a quiet testimony yeah. for a long time and like we said, the answering of questions. Um, I'm, I'm convinced that in the, the years that we've been in the church that our family's understanding of the Catholic faith is very different yeah. from what it was. Absolutely. Because of our being there. And uh, so we have hope for a lot of things to come. Let's take this next email comes from a lonely convert. It says, hi, how do you meet and get to know converts within the Catholic Church? We find it difficult to meet other converts. We find that people come to Mass and there seems to be little fellowship outside of Mass. That had been a real issue for me when we were considering joining the Catholic Church. I, I found Protestant and particularly Charismatic churches very friendly. People were warm and open and it was pretty easy to get to know others. And In the Catholic Church I felt people were really cold and um, didn't welcome me into their fellowship. But I began to realize that part of that had to do with the, the respect that we have for the Eucharist when we're inside the church so that when church is, when mass is over, we are to be reverent and quiet. And when church is over in a Protestant service, you can just stand around and talk and gab and laugh and do whatever you want. But in the Catholic Church, when Mass is over, we need to be quiet and respectful towards our Lord, our Eucharistic Lord. And a lot of the old buildings don't have gathering spaces where it makes it easy to mix with other people and, and talk. Um, we finally just, Paul and I just finally had to just start introducing ourselves to people going up and say, hi, we're Paul and Lisa Thigpen, and we're new in the church. And um, that's how we got to know people, basically. Got involved in parish ministry. Music ministry, RCIA, PSR, all those typical things, and, and asking around. But I think you know, she has her finger on it. That there's a there's a different notion, at least traditionally, that Catholics come to church to worship, and their attention is on God. Yeah. And fellowship can come out of that. But while you're in the church, and when you go, you're focused on the Lord, on prayer, on reflection, on above all the Eucharist. And not so much on patting each other on the back and how you do it. And that's not a bad thing. But, uh, you know, just the fact that I come into a Catholic church and I genuflect because the Lord's in the tabernacle. I went to a Baptist church the other night and didn't, of course. There was no tabernacle and folks were standing around talking. It's a very different kind of thing. I wonder if, as a historian, that this fellowship idea that we so appreciated as evangelical Protestants is in fact a fairly modern idea in the idea that before when Catholics were in a community that all the Catholics were together they knew each other their fellowship was all week long and then they would go to mass for that one central reason and then they would leave their neighborhoods were all Catholics and also Puritan days it was the same way with Protestants they were all in the same community but modern we travel so far to go to the church we choose so people are traveling 20 miles, 10 miles, 5 miles, and that's the only time they see these people, so that's why it has grown to become a fellowship center as opposed to a worship-focused center. And the sad thing is we start to see that in the Catholic churches for maybe the same reasons. Mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right. You just you get the sense. You study church history. When the community is all in the church, mm -hmm. or most of it, you went to church with your neighbors, you don't have to talk about fellowship. You lived it. <laughs> it was all, life. All, yeah, seven days a week. And uh, but when you came to church, you had one thing in mind. Yeah. 
that was encountering the Lord. So the encouragement might be for us not to change what we do in the sanctuary, right. but take opportunities outside the sanctuary to build the friendships that maybe are diff are fragmented because mm -hmm. of our communities mm -hmm. fragment. Let's take our next caller, it's Anne from Arkansas. Hello, Anna. Hi. What's your question for us tonight? Well, I'm I'm a cradle Catholic and uh, I'm married to a Baptist. <laughs> now he goes to church with me, uh -huh. and he he likes it. And when he's around other non-Catholics, he defends us to the hilt. <laughs> He'll say, no, 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 that's, that's not what goes on there. They don't worship Mary, etc. My only problem is, how can I bring him home? He thinks that by becoming Catholic, he's going to be turning his back on his Baptist upbringing. Mm -hmm. okay. And thank you for your question. Did you have any of those feelings yourselves as you were making the journey? Well, we had changed so many times, I guess we didn't have a strong <laughs> sense of loyalty to it. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, by the time we joined the church, my parents, my family didn't belong to the same tradition. They had grown up. My mother had been Methodist. My father was Lutheran. They raised us Presbyterian. Then they ended up wow. Baptist. So it, and, and that's pretty common in America, actually. But um, Anna's question, I, my experience was during those two years that I'd, I just felt I had to live the life. Lisa knew what I was thinking and wanting. I had to live the life and I had to love her as much as I could and uh, and wait and pray. And that sounds like a vague kind of thing to say. And yet it, I, I don't know what else I could have done at that point. I, I think we both came to the place of understanding that becoming Catholic wasn't a betrayal of what we had been brought up with, but it was a fulfillment. And that was an important thing that, you know, that I could say to my family, I'm not rejecting yeah. what you did for me, teaching me to pray, teaching me to praise, tell, showing me how important it was to be in the church and the community of saints. This is all a fulfillment and a completion of that. I'm not in any way rejecting. Yeah. I'm, I'm completing. That's a very important point. I think so many of the guests on the journey home have universally <laughs> said that we're not anti whatever we were. We're not anti-Baptist, anti-Presbyterian, because we thank God mm -hmm. for their witness that brought us to Jesus Christ brought us a conviction to seek truth and to study mm -hmm. scripture. Mm -hmm. And so, as you said, it's a, like being a fulfilled evangelical mm -hmm. or a fulfilled Baptist. Mm -hmm. So we encourage Anna to, as you said, model the faith, continue to pray, uh, and to be open to the positiveness of their background, of his background, and see how it fits in. Let's take our next email. It's from Joe. What traditions from your time as charismatics, do you continue to practice now as Catholics? For example, are you involved in charismatic or Pentecostalism in the church? We're not at all. Um, when we first became Catholic, there was a parish that had a charismatic mass once a month, and we went to that, and it felt strange to have the mass and the charismatic mixed together, and um, we decided not to pursue that. but. I think in our personal prayer lives, there, there are plenty of things we've you know, continued. I, in, in the Protestant charismatic circles, I, I really learned a lot about how to hear from God, mm. how to get quiet before God and give Him a chance to speak, mm. and how even to sometimes to be the recipient of, of something for someone else. Not that I would say, thus saith the Lord and point a finger, but you know, to be able to, in prayer, I'd hear some, I'd get an impression about someone and go to Him and say, you know, I heard this in prayer, and you judge it and see if it may be from the Lord. But I believe and give us something. Those are all part of what we learned in the, in the charismatic movement as Protestants. Like we are saying, there's a lot, you know, a lot to be uh, affirmed there that's good. Um, praying in tongues, I still do it sometimes. Uh, other gifts, uh, expectancy about God working miracles, the conviction that he really can heal, that he can do other things. At the same time, we have come to love the traditional liturgy of the church so much that that's what we want, <laughs> you know, on Sundays. And, uh, it's really interesting it's because that's almost <laughs> universal among, among so many of the evangelical converts. We used to be in churches where every Sunday we reinvented worship. Yes. Now we don't want messing around with the worship at all. Right. We want the Mass the way the church mm -hmm. said it ought to be done, done reverently. Mm -hmm. And we stand tight on that. We can still enjoy exuberant worship, too. And, you know, that... But I'd rather have it outside of Mass, personally. I, I just have fallen in love with the traditional Mass. Yeah. Yeah. We've had fun. We're going to keep our eye on time here. I was just thinking is, 
So think about all the things we're talking. I want to make sure we don't misunderstand something we mentioned earlier when you were talking about one of the, the struggling traditions that you had to struggle with about burying old St. Mm -hmm. Joel. That's not an official teaching of the church, obviously, no. right? I mean, what, what kind of a tradition we call it? How would we view that in relationship to other traditions in the church? It might be good to clarify traditions in the church in that sense. When we talk about, uh, one way to talk about is to speak of the big T tradition and the little T yeah. <laughs> tradition. Uh, the notion that within the church there is a body of received truth, wisdom, uh, both for faith and for practice, that has come down to us from Christ through the apostles, uh, that has been developed in the life of the church, proven and tested, has been affirmed and often defined then by the sacred magisterium, the councils of the church, uh, and some, sometimes by the, the popes. And that th this is the big T tradition that carries with it the, the way of the church. And there's scripture references that yeah, we have some that oh, just one the that, tradition, not just written but oral. For example, that's right. This is what is spoken of in Second Thessalonians when Paul says, So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught by us, either by word or mouth, word of mouth or by letter. That's the capital T you, tradition. You read the early church fathers, just a generation or two after the apostles, and, and they're saying to the Gnostic heretics, you know, we have a tradition that's not written in these books. Uh, how else will we know, they say, for instance, how to, how to have a mass, <laughs> how to have the liturgy. Those things were passed on to us from the apostles. They're not written in the books. What so about the little there. T ones? But the little T ones are uh, the, the kinds of things that people develop kind of on their own, not always with the approval of the church or even with the knowledge of the church, that will express their faith. And sometimes they're, they're things that over, the, over a period of time become uh, proven, tested by time, accepted by a lot of folks, and they are in keeping with the traditions of the church. And the so church that, will give its blessing Right, to it. give its blessing to it. So, for instance, a vote of candles <laughs> would yeah. be an example of that. Or um, the Stations of the Cross is a fine example of that, mm -hmm. something that's only a few centuries old. But after it developed and began to spread, it was very clear to the church that this was something to be approved and embraced. And so now we have Stations mm -hmm. of the Cross in, you know, in the churches. But then there are the little... The yeah, little T traditions that never quite bit. make it that far, <laughs> and um, and some of them may you know may seem a bit superstitious that kind of thing. But even then, I think the quality depends on whether the focus of the person doing it is on God, on His grace, or whether they're treating it like some kind of magical thing, and uh, and whether it's it's accompanied by genuine faith and prayer. And in America, this is particularly a, can be a struggle because we are such a melting pot of so many cultures. Uh, so we have. Polish and German and Irish and Italian and French and Czechoslovakia and all those traditions as they immigrate here. So they had years and years, centuries of, of definition and practice and acceptance in another culture, then they're brought into us and they can see so different. Mm -hmm. So that's what makes it sometimes uh, seem so foreign to us, especially as converts coming into the church. Let's take this caller. This is Roger from Ontario. Hello, Roger. What's your question for us? Hi there. I was just wondering if your guests can talk about some of the different kinds of customs or traditions they had as Methodists at Christmas time, and if it was hard for them to get used to, say, some of the things that we do as Catholics, like Advent around Christmas. Thank you, and God bless you. Uh, same to you, Roger. Thank you. In, in our Methodist church, we had an Advent wreath, and we had Advent candles. Um, so our church, Methodist church, celebrated Advent. We didn't have one personally in my home when we were growing up, but we did have it at church. We had a, a beautiful um, tree called a chrismon tree that was in the sanctuary, and it was just a big green evergreen covered with lights, and all the ornaments on this chrismon tree were ornaments, white and gold ornaments that told something about the life of Jesus or about the nativity story or pointed out some aspect of our faith, like there would be crowns and anchors and yeah. triangles and that all kind of thing. Symbols, all the, all the symbols, symbols of yeah. the faith, right. So um, that was a tradition that we already had in my church. A, a lot of Protestant um, churches do celebrate Advent. And that's interesting as a historian. That 150 years ago, an awful lot of Protestant churches didn't celebrate Christmas. Isn't that true? Yes, the, <clears throat> the Puritans made it a law that you had to work on Christmas and you couldn't close business and have games and that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> Christmas was seen as a popish festival by a lot of Protestants. So all those like Advent and all those other uh, Epiphany were all not a part of the tradition. Then later, as different 
uh, tradition, uh, Christian denominations have appreciated the traditions. Let's take our next caller. This is Tom from Massachusetts. Hello, Tom. What's your question for us tonight? Yes, hi. Hi, Marcus and Mr. and Mrs. Stigton. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, I know most Protestants uh, uh, pray to the triune God, and I was wondering if it was uh, hard to overcome or if uh, it's difficult to pray uh, to the Virgin Mother and to the saints to ask them for uh, gifts of grace. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. It was really hard for me. I, I, I didn't want to do it. I just, it was a strange notion to me. I had the, I guess, the wrong idea of prayer to start with. Um, Paul enlightened me by explaining to me, you know, that prayer was just simply asking somebody for something that it, um, it, it was, it was okay. I, I might ask you to pray for me, so it was okay for me to ask the Blessed Mother to pray for me, or to ask Saint Thomas More to pray for me, or. Teresa of Avila to pray for me because I might ask you to pray or I might ask Paul to pray and once I had that understanding of it then I was okay with it I was comfortable with it but until then I had I wasn't one of the things I think that was lost in the Reformation was the notion of secondary causes <laughs> the idea that uh, that God is behind the world going on and the things that happen and his providence directs and provides for us but that he most often does it through mediating influences. And it's all through the scripture how the angels do this for him or do that for him. And, uh, and glimpses of how in the end we will share his glory, we will reign and rule with him, all those kinds of things. That there are these secondary causes, that we ourselves are secondary causes. You know, my, my parents were a secondary cause, uh, faith in me, grace from God. And to have to realize that it's, it doesn't, it's not a zero-sum game when it comes to glory and this kind of thing, that anything that a saint does for you is taken away from God, or any honor you give to a saint is taken away from God, because it's a zero-sum game, but rather that he is glorified in his saints, as the scripture says. Because he, the saints are saints because of grace, which is the work right. of God in their right. life. So right. You praise a masterpiece, and when you're praising the masterpiece, you're praising the master who, who, who painted it. it We've got a couple minutes left. Here we are on the threshold of the, the Jubilee. As you look to the Jubilee uh, traditions, uh, what are some suggestions you might leave to the audience of ways they can grow closer to Christ as we look to this coming year? I'd say the most important, most important tradition of all is some kind of regular family devotional time together. It's one of the toughest traditions to maintain because it's, it's costly and our schedules are so hectic but I would say, and sometimes we, you drop the ball, but I'd say pick it up again and go. If you have to adapt it, if you have to change it, if you have to vary it, do it. But above all, if you want to center your home around Christ, you've got to have a regular time of prayer with the Lord as a family together. And there's nothing like it, whether it's rosary, whether it's other kinds of prayer. Reading the Mass, reading the Mass. Yeah, we've lectionary. done that, whatever. You, you, you've got to do that regularly. Praying novenas together, we mm -hmm. do that sometimes when there's a particular need, and that has drawn us really close together as a family. Is praying novenas. Do that, and all the rest will fall in place, I think. And I think you were also, you said that the most important tradition, of course, is that wonderful sacrament of visiting the Blessed Sacrament together as a family, and and recognizing the centrality of that in our mm -hmm. faith, isn't it? I mean, it, yes, weekday mornings we're we're at mass when at all possible and uh, Eucharistic Adoration, all that. We, well, thank you very much, you. both of you, for joining us on the journey. Thank, thank you, Marcus. Being God candid you. with the audience. Thank you for your book. I don't think I've held it up at all during the program, Building Catholic Family Traditions. Paul and Lisa Thigben, uh, it's uh, our Sunday visitor book. Is that right? That's right. It'd be a good place to start for the coming year as you think about ways that we can grow closer to Christ. And uh, sometimes Christ calls you to go in places he, you never intended. Is that right? And, even the Catholic Church, <laughs> That's right. and the beauties of it, because it's there that you have such intimacy with Christ in so many ways, in the traditions, in the sacramentals, in the sacrament of the Eucharist. Thank you for joining us. Thank you also for joining us. And as we are on this threshold of the Jubilee, I ask that we would pray for one another so that in our lives, our witness would be faithful uh, and clear to those around us, that our traditions would point to Jesus Christ, so that together, together as we walk on the journey, we can point to our Savior and Lord. God bless.